All the judges are ready. The timer. Yep. All right, and I'll begin. In my last negative speech at this round, I'm just going to be reiterating some of the arguments and refuting some of the argumentation that Alex made in his speech, starting off with the new argument he brought up of fiscal crisis. Now, I've already sort of addressed this with my, uh, with my evidence. Firstly, the evidence said that there was no debt crisis at all because interest payments were so low. There was no, interest pay uh, there was no debt crisis because they were only at 1.4% of GDP. Secondly, I read a piece of evidence specifically that said taxes would make any debt crisis even worse, and there's no justifiable reason for them. And as we saw, economic stagnation and economic harm will result from the affirmative team's plan. There's no justification for reducing the deficit there. Now, um, also, I'd like to point out that the impact they brought up was of a fiscal crisis. Now, a fiscal crisis is a point at which all investors lose confidence in the government's borrowing. That's a brink scenario, meaning that once they reach a certain point, the crisis will happen no matter what. And they said that point was if we don't reduce the deficit by $4 trillion. They claimed that there was $2 trillion in the status quo, and they claimed to generate $1.8 trillion. So the numbers don't add up. They still need $200 billion dollars in order to avoid this fiscal crisis that they claim to. Now they said that there would be more opportunities to reduce the deficit in the future, therefore that would help them reduce the future deficit and avoid the crisis, but as we've seen in the past, the pre past precedent shows us that politicians are not responsible with the budget and they won't use the opportunities in the future to reduce the deficit because they've had opportunities in the past and they haven't taken them to reduce the deficit. With that in mind, let's move down to the, uh, talking about China. Now, my one overall response to all of his argumentation is that they can right now. Right now, the affirmative team is claiming that China has the ability to cause all this economic harm. Now, they don't reduce the actual debt amount that China holds. So they, under their plan, by definition, they still will have the same amount of debt they will just be borrowing less in the future. And if they have, and if they have, and if they can do, uh, if they can cause the impact to come about with the current amount of debt they have, they don't reduce that debt, they can obviously still cause the impact under the affirmative team's plan. They don't solve for this harm. They don't, uh, they don't solve this impact from coming about. Now let's move into high frequency trading. Firstly, he responded that there's too much liquidity in the current system. But my response to this is that be there becomes too little under their plan. See, high-frequency traders, as they've said over and over, account for 50% of the market. That's one half of the market they account for. They're providing half of the market's volume, half of the market's liquidity. And so by reducing the market by 50%, they're going to be making our low. They're making, going to be making our environment, our market environment, a low liquidity environment. And they read a piece of evidence specifically saying that financial transactions tax would raise volatility in a low liquid environment. That means post plan, the FTT in the future will actually be raising market volume or uh, market um, volatility. Now, my second response is that there was no evidence saying that there was too much liquidity right now in the U.S. The evidence wasn't specific to the U.S. It was just saying too much liquidity is bad. It didn't say there was too much in the U.S. Now, let's look at um, the uh, argument about prices. He said there was none in the 1980s. And my first response is that the markets have changed. Changed. High-frequency traders have become an integral part of the United States markets. That's seen in the fact that they're 50% of the markets. But my second response is that he didn't respond to my specific reasons for why high-frequency traders lower price errors and uh, such and benefit all investors. Those three reasons were, firstly, they reduce pricing errors. Secondly, they improve pricing efficiency. And thirdly, they lower transaction costs, benefiting all investors in the, in the entire market. Now, responding to the solvency point of revenue, my one overall, he said the taxes don't harm, and then he said that the deficit is more important and it's only HFT being affected. My two responses are, first, taxes are short-term focused. Taxes are short-term focused. My, I read a piece of evidence saying this. My second response is that the economy is hurt under their plan. My third response is that empirics versus none. We saw how that this is specifically responding to his arguments about migration, how the prices are different and the U.S. is good. They brought up no empirical examples showing that traders would stay in the United States, whereas we have five empirical examples, five different countries showing that invasion occurs under the affirmative team's plan. Moving into the solvency point of HFT, he says that there's already a financial transactions tax in the status quo. Firstly, this tax doesn't tax everyone. 
because he admitted in cross-examination. Secondly, how do they know if they're not, if the high-frequency traders aren't passing their limits and not um, and they're evading? So for all these reasons, I would urge you to vote for the negative team. Thank you.